I have the pleasure of introducing today's speaker. Fred Hawker is an archaeologist and historian, currently the director of research at the Vasa Museum in Stockholm. He was formerly the Yamini Professor of Nautical Archaeology at Texas A&M University. He has excavated and reconstructed shipwrecks from the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and early modern periods in the United States, the Netherlands, Turkey, Denmark, and Sweden. And most important of all, he's a 1979 graduate of Loudoun County High School in Leesburg, Virginia, where I graduated two years earlier. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Lynn also didn't mention that I also went out with her for a little while when I was in high school, <laughs> which was a great pleasure, I'll say. Uh, so I'm, and I'm very happy to be asked to give a talk for you, and I'm looking forward to this. Uh, and I think, if, if I recall correctly, I should get this done in about 20 minutes, right? And I'm going to attempt to share my screen. This worked before. There we are. And what I'd like to talk to you about today uh, is part of my job as an archeologist and historian working with the find of Vasa, a Swedish warship that sank on its maiden voyage in 1628. And I'm not going to talk that much about the ship itself but more about the people that were on, that were on board, who were on board, uh, and how we go about trying to figure out who they were. This is a research theme. We have six big research themes uh, at the museum. And this one goes by the name of Who Are You? Uh, trying to get closer to the people who were there when the ship sank. And, and part of this is talking about what can we know about people who have been dead for nearly 400 years. Uh, the ship itself uh, was built in 1626, 1627, uh, and was badly designed, and so it basically sank during the commissioning ceremony. Uh, and its entire operational career lasted about 30 minutes uh, and about 1,200 yards. Um, it, uh, the cold, uh, polluted waters of Stockholm Harbor preserved the ship very well, and so in 1961, it was possible to raise the ship largely intact and even refloat it briefly. And here it is moving into a dry dock floating on its own keel after 333 years underwater. Uh, after it was raised, uh, a team of 12 archaeologists spent five months excavating the interior of the ship and recovering nearly 30,000 uh, different objects. Basically everything that had been on board, uh, except for the cannon, most of which had been salvaged after the ship sank, uh, and some of the very fragile organic material. Uh, but a surprising uh, amount of survival of what we would normally consider fairly fragile material, uh, such as uh, cloth, even paper in some cases. Uh, the ship itself, just as a quick introduction, uh, is uh, completely uh, reconstructed now, um, at least the hull and the lower masts. Uh, it's 69 meters long, uh, and I think that works out to just about 230 feet. Uh, about 12 meters or close to 40 feet wide, about 60 feet high at the stern. And in service, it weighed a total of about 1,300 tons. Um, and what's most remarkable is that a little bit more than 98% of the original structure of the ship survives. It's essentially an intact building. Uh, and before COVID, we were the most visited, it was the centerpiece of the most visited maritime museum in the world, with about one and a half million visitors annually from all over the world. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, however, is uh, not uh, the ship so much, but the crew uh, and what we can learn about them. We have some historical data that tells us what the crew should have been. Uh, the, the manning requirements for that year suggest that VASA, which is the second item on this list, should have had a crew made up of 133 mariners who sailed the ship, uh, plus 300 soldiers uh, who would man the guns and, and fight the ship. The soldiers were not on board because you only took them on board if you were actually going into battle because otherwise they were useless mouths you had to feed. Uh, and so in this case, we on, only the sailors were on board. We don't know exactly how many actually turned up on the day, uh, but we do know that they weren't alone. And so when we look at the people on board, we don't really talk about 
the crew. They're a part of a bigger group um, that we would refer to as a community. Uh, and that uh, includes uh, people who are not technically part of the crew, like the carpenters. They were employees of the shipyard who built the ship. They were along as you could say the service contract. There were two cats that were part of the crew. Their job was to keep the rat population in check and an unknown number of women and children uh, who were part of the shipboard community. Some were there just as guests for the day. We know that from historical records, um, but the others were probably going to stay with the ship as long as it was in home waters. Um, about 30 of these people died, uh, including women and children, and I'm afraid to say the two cats. Uh, a Swedish uh, warship in this period had women on board usually, as long as you were in domestic waters. The regulations for the Navy stated specifically, there shall be no whores on board our ships. And by this, they meant unmarried women. Uh, but wives may accompany their husbands as long as the ship is in the stream or the archipelago, that is in Swedish waters. And it is not expected to meet the enemy. Uh, although if you suddenly encountered the enemy, I don't know how much effort was made to get the women and children ashore if you just put them in a safe place. Um, if we talk about the people connected to the ship, it's not, uh, there are several different contexts we could talk about that are related. There are those who are on board, but there are also the people in the shipyard that built the ship and set it up. The people in the countryside who produced all the raw materials uh, to build the ship, such as the timber or the hemp for the rope, uh, as well as the families uh, that provided the men who became the crew. Uh, and then even people abroad who were producing both people and resources uh, to put the ship into operation. In this case, we're just going to look at the people who were on board, uh, what we call Voss's people. Uh, trigger warning, I should have given you there. There is one photo of human remains here. Um, and in this case, we do have the remains of some of the people who were on board, about half of the people who died when the ship sank. Uh, those are 11 or 12 well-defined individuals inside the ship. Generally speaking, human remains found on this ship are found as discrete skeletons, not just as random bones. There are a few, but mostly we can identify individuals, plus another four or five people uh, outside the ship in where the, the stern collapsed. They were in the stern cabins, and, the, and their remains ended up with the remains of the furniture. Uh, plus uh, a few bones from at least two other individuals uh, who don't have substantial remains. Uh, most of these people were on the upper decks in the ship. Almost all of these remains are found near the ladders. They're, tr they're clearly trying to get out of the ship uh, at the moment that it was sinking, but it sank so quickly that uh, they, were they were unable to get out. Uh, and so these are where these people were found. You can see they have names. Uh, these have been assigned to the skeletons in order so that we have a way to keep them straight as individuals. They were originally just given letters uh, by the archaeologists who excavated the ship. Um, in the 1990s, uh, an osteologist who studied the remains decided that was dehumanizing. Uh, and so she assigned them names based on the Swedish radio code. Uh, we don't use whiskey tango, foxtrot. We use names to spell things. Uh, and so you may note here that there's at least one woman, Beata. Uh, otherwise, most of the skeletons are male, uh, but we'll come back to that. And the lower decks of the ship, there are only really two people who seem to have died there. One probably because he was guarding the gunpowder, and the other seems to have been someone who fell down to that level from higher up in the ship. And if you want to in this, ask me in the chat or in the question how I know that. In summary, um, these are mostly male. There are 13 uh, that are in the age 16 to 50 plus years old, although most are in their 20s and 30s. Um, they range from 160 to 176 centimeters tall. That's about five foot two to about five foot eight, uh, but they average around five foot five, five foot five and a half. Uh, there are two female skeletons, adult female skeletons in their 20s or 30s, um, and they're both average height for the time, which is around five foot two, five foot three. Uh, we also have a single uh, arm bone from a child less than 10 years old. Um, it's in very poor condition. It's incomplete. Uh, and so it's quite difficult to judge exactly what the age is. 
Uh, it's hard to judge age from long bones at that age, young people. Um, if you have a skull, you can tell from the teeth which ones have erupted uh, approximately how old a person was. Uh, we've been analyzing these people, not just through the normal osteological measures of looking at the bones, but also some chemical and other analysis to try to figure out their medical history. Uh, we've uh, done DNA analysis of most of the skeletons, and we've succeeded in extracting both mitochondrial DNA, uh, which is a small portion of your DNA that you inherit unchanged from your mother, and it's a way to trace descent. Um, and then we have succeeded in extracting a more complete uh, nuclear DNA profile from some individuals. Uh, the, if you're interested, the best place to get DNA where it lasts the longest in your skeleton, it used to be thought was your teeth, uh, but in recent years, it's become clear that the, the place in your body that your DNA lasts the longest is in something called the petrous bone. That's the part of your skull where your ear canal goes in. Uh, and that, that's, that's the best place to get DNA. And so that's the, in the photograph on the right, that's the bone that's been cut out of this partial skull. Uh, on, uh, in order to reconstruct who these people were, we can use some conventional techniques that have been used for years in the forensic world. For example, reconstructing their appearance. Um, this has, by the way, relatively little scientific value for early modern people. It's mostly of public value for communication purposes. Um, there's not a lot we learn by knowing what somebody looked like, um, although it's sometimes interesting to hear what the visitors to the museum think they can see in a reconstructed face. Oh, he looks very Finnish. Oh, he must be a Dane because people in Scandinavia have very clear ideas about how people from other countries look, um, most of which turn out not to have a lot of basis in scientific uh, fact. Um, this type of reconstruction was pioneered almost a century and a quarter ago uh, in Russia uh, after people discovered that what makes you look like you is the shape of your skull. Um, the thickness of the soft tissue on top of the skull is more or less the same for everybody. Uh, and so if you can reconstruct the musculature and the skin, uh, you can get a fairly accurate idea of what somebody looks like. And this is used to identify murder victims, for example. Uh, and historically, uh, reconstructions of this type successfully get a, an identification about 60% of the time. So there's a better than even chance that if you'd known this person when he was alive, you would recognize him uh, from, his, uh, from his face. What's interesting is, you still get a good uh, identification, even if you get the ethnicity wrong. That if, if we had reconstructed this as a person of African descent, for example, uh, we probably still would have been able to get an identification, which suggests that ethnicity is not one of the things that we use to tell each other apart. Uh, we also can look at a person's possessions that they had with them at the time to see something. And so this is this particular gentleman that I just showed you, who was an older fellow, probably in his late 40s into his 50s, um, was carrying a musket and a lantern uh, and was guarding the gunpowder store. Uh, we, I tend to think of him as the guard in the dark. Uh, and the, the lantern actually has a burn mark on the underside from where it tipped over as the ship was sinking. It might be an indication of just how long it took the ship to sink. We've successfully reconstructed uh, the faces of six people this way. Um, here you can see four of them, all ad adult males. Uh, we also have uh, one female, Beata, who we successfully have been able to reconstruct. Uh, and one interesting person, uh, Gustav. Now, Gustav is a, a very good object lesson in what we can and can't know about people of the past. Archaeologically, we have a reasonably good chance of determining from your bones, your sex, basically whether you're male or female. Uh, although we now understand that that's not a binary choice, even biologically, it's a spectrum. Uh, and so uh, what we can tell by looking at your bones, by the shape of your skull, the shape of your pelvis, is we can get one of five possible results really, or one, five ranges, male, probably male, I have no idea, probably female and yeah, female. And most people statistically fall towards the ends of that spectrum. It's an inverse bell curve. 
but there are a substantial number of people uh, whose um, biological sexual characteristics are not very well defined. Uh, and we all know people like that, uh, people who have what we call androgynous features. But we do have uh, well-established cues that we pick up that let us determine from looking at a person, regardless of their hairstyle or how they're dressed, and often that we'll look and say, oh, that's a, that person's female or that person's male. What we're really talking about is sex. We cannot determine archaeologically gender. Gender has two components. It's who you think you are. There's no way to recover that archaeologically. It's just no way to tell. That's in your, that's in your mind. It's hardwired into your brain, and only you know the answer to that. And if you don't write it down for an historian to read, we'll never know. Now, how you present yourself to the world, we might be able to figure that out if you leave, if we find your clothing, for example, and you come from a culture where men and women dress differently. And most Western European cultures, that is the case. And most Western European cultures operate on the principle of male, female, binary uh, organization of society. Other cultures in other parts of the world don't. You might be interested to know. Gustav was initially identified by the first osteologist who looked at the remains as female. Uh, that, and that osteologist was a man. The second osteologist who looked at him in the 1990s, a woman decided that Gustav was a man. And so this reconstruction was done of Gustav as a man. And then the latest uh, osteologist to look at Gustav thinks Gustav is actually Yoro, a woman. And the nuclear DNA confirms that this person has the right chromosomes to be considered female. However, the facial characteristics are not distinctive. The, this is a, the, the lower part of the face has very distinctly male characteristics. The upper part of this face have characteristics that we would normally consider female. Unfortunately, there are no objects associated with this skeleton to tell us how this person defined his or her or their uh, identity. So we're left by saying biologically female, but that's about all we can tell you. Another case of how we sometimes get turned around in this uh, is looking at another person. And now I'm going to give you two quick case studies on two people we can say quite a lot about based on a combination of their remains and, and their possessions. And I call this first one the wrong trousers because I'm going to start with the possessions. These are textiles. We have quite a lot of textiles that were found uh, associated with a skeleton. Uh, and these uh, textiles were originally reconstructed as a pair of trousers or breeches, actually, short trousers. And you can see on the left side, the gathers along what is the waistline of the, of the garment. And in fact, uh, this, uh, these fragments were used to reconstruct a set of clothing for a typical Vasa sailor, this fairly creepy, I think, mannequin, uh, we, which is a pastiche of garments found all over the ship. And in fact, the trousers are a pastiche of fragments from several different places that don't all belong together. So this fragment was used for the right left or the front left leg. This fragment was used for the front right leg, but they don't come from the same place. They don't originally belong together. And you'll note they're two different colors. We have a major project going looking at all of the clothing remains from the ship, which is the largest collection of ordinary people's everyday clothing from any one single use context in the world. This is the best way to know how ordinary Swedes dressed. And we're looking at over 5,000 textile fragments and over 6,000 leather fragments from shoes, boots, mittens, and gloves. And so if we actually piece all the fragments of this garment back together, way too long to be a pair of trousers. It's about 85 centimeters, which is about 34 inches, maybe 32 inches, something like that. Uh, and so once you put it all together, it's too long to be a pair of trousers. Trousers stopped at the knee in, these, in this period. Uh, it's possible to do this by comparing distinct discontinuities in the weave matching up seams and that sort of thing. And if we look at where this was found and the skeletal remains, we get a very interesting story. Uh, we have the black uh, boxes here represent individual bones that we now know from DNA analysis all belong to the same person. Uh, and we have one group of bones here uh, that are all the lower half of a skeleton. 
the legs and feet. And we have a second group that are the, the upper half, rib cage, arms, skull. Um, and they're separated because there was a cannon there originally. And so this person probably died lying across the cannon and the body separated into two parts and the jacket kept the upper half all together and the other garment kept the lower half together. What's interesting is that uh, long garment that's not a pair of trousers was found with the lower half of a skeleton. The skeleton was identified immediately as female, that this is Beata. However, the archeologists who excavated the site simply assumed that everybody on board the ship was male. And so they identified the garment as trousers because it had a waistband without bothering to look at the fact that the bones they found this garment draped on belonged to a woman. They simply assumed that everybody on board was male. And in fact, if you look on the right, what they used as the right front leg of that mannequin is in fact one of the sleeves to the jacket for this woman, for Beata. And it's possible to reconstruct her quite in quite a lot of detail. So I'd like you to meet Beata. Her bones were found commingled with those of a male uh, about 10 years older than she is. Um, and because most women would be on board as wives of men, uh, th there's a possibility that she is the wife of that other skeleton, uh, whom we call Cesar. We can see that she's about 20 or 25 years old. She's about five foot two, which is average height for a woman. Uh, from DNA, we know she had brown eyes. Uh, we also can see that she, had very, she was malnourished. She had poor nutrition. Uh, she had low copper and zinc values, which suggests she probably suffered from anemia or chronic uh, diarrhea. Uh, she was wearing a reddish brown jacket of the same cut as you see in this uh, painting of a Dutch fishwife uh, and a dark skirt, actually very similar to this woman. Uh, her shoes were very nicely made shoes that had been repaired and she had probably bought them secondhand. And she was wearing an embroidered shawl or bonnet uh, because across the shoulders of her jacket, under a microscope, we can see lint from silk, individual colored silk fibers which are probably from the embroidery of what she was wearing over the jacket. And we think it might be possible if we map those carefully enough to reconstruct what that embroidered pattern was. And this is a facial reconstruction of the somewhat malnourished uh, Beata. Now, in other cases, we don't have a skeleton. We only have the possessions. Uh, this is a distribution map of all of the textile finds, all the clothing finds from the upper gun decks, which is where most of them were. Uh, and on the uppermost deck, most of these are either loose finds lying on the deck or they're directly associated with human remains. Um, but we do have an area in the bow on both, which is full of chests and barrels and sacks of people's personal possessions, where they'd been stowed there for the initial part of the voyage. Um, now, sometimes that context alone will tell us something. So this is a lower deck in the ship where there aren't very many finds, but we do have uh, a chest with clothing in it found in a small compartment. And because the clothing was in a chest full of tools, we know they belong to a carpenter. In another case nearby, we have a chest full of uh, personal possessions that include clothing that also include a linstock, a thing you use for firing a cannon. And this is in a compartment that was only accessible if you were one of the master gunners on board. And so that's probably uh, the master gunner's possessions. He's somebody we know from historical records. So we might be able to link his possessions to, to what he did before he got joined fossil. In other cases, all we have is a chest of belongings from this big mass in the bow. And so in this particular chest, uh, we have enough finds that we believe we can reconstruct a person to whom we've given the fictive name of Balthazar, uh, which was a not uncommon name in Sweden at the time, Balthazar. Those of you with biblical backgrounds may have heard that name before. Uh, and those include uh, what was found in that chest were all the things he thought he needed to take to sea with him. It includes uh, stuff for cooking and eating, a pot to cook in, uh, a bucket to serve food in. This is the normal thing that you serve food in if you weren't one of the officers. Uh, as well as bowls and spoons for eating in wood. 
The fact that he ate with wood uh, suggests he's not one of the officers who dined in the stern, usually on ceramic or metal uh, plates and bowls. But he has very nice shoes. There's a very nice pair of shoes in this uh, cask. Uh, and we can see uh, they have a stacked up heel, which was a very new fashion in Sweden at the time, very up to the minute. Uh, and it's the more expensive way to make a shoe that we know of, of the two main ways. So this is a guy who's spending some money on his shoes. And keep in mind, he's wearing another pair of shoes. So this is a guy who has enough money to own a spare pair of shoes. And these are relatively new, we can see. He also, and of course, accessories make the outfit. Uh, and so he has uh, accessories that tell us a lot. Uh, so there are a lot of buttons uh, associated with the clothing. Uh, these you can see are cast pewter with a little brass wire eye. And the thing on the right that looks like a toothpick is called a point. It's a little bit of rolled brass sheet covered in gold leaf. And these decorated the laces that you used that tied your jacket to your trousers. You didn't use a belt to hold your trousers up. You tied your jacket to your trousers. And so your jacket acted as the suspenders. Uh, he also had a belt, but you wore a belt to hang stuff on, not to hold your trousers up. Uh, and this is a sword belt. It has uh, the suspension gear for carrying a rapier. Uh, and next to the chet, to this barrel, not in it, was the scabbard and the grip for a rapier. So this is somebody who owned and would have carried a sword, which really you were only allowed to do if you were considered a gentleman. He also had a fair amount of money in his chest, 295 copper coins, or next almost 40 pounds uh, weight of copper. And that is, doesn't, is, is not maybe as much money as it might sound like, but it was worth about $9, the Swedish unit of currency at the time, the equivalent of two months pay for an ordinary sailor. So a sixth of his annual pay, if this was an ordinary sailor, it would be a smaller proportion if he was someone of higher rank. So it's one of the largest coin hoards or group of groups of coins that we have from the ship. Also, he has a set of clothing. Uh, 584 fragments, uh, seven different types of woolen fabrics, two different types of bast fiber, that's either linen or hemp, and even uh, some tablet woven silk. Uh, this, uh, are his, these are his trousers or breeches, and these are in fact breeches. Uh, we often call them the lurid purple trousers because they are in fact dyed purple. Uh, they're actually what you call plum brown or tannin. And it's been possible to, re we can see that they're made of uh, wool in this color called tannet. Uh, they have an interlining to stiffen them, to make them stand out, uh, out of waxed linen, it still has the wax in it, material called velk, uh, and then lined with linen. Uh, and we've been able to put enough of the fragments back together to see what the style is. And these are a little bit old fashioned for 1628. They're the style of short, full breeches that was common about 20 years earlier or 15 years earlier. This is a, an original pair from the 1620s uh, in a museum in London. Um, and these are actually a style that goes back into the 16th century. It, it, the, the, the ones you see in uh, Shakespeare plays where the guy looks like he's wearing a pair of beach balls that don't quite come down to his knees. So, very, but very fancy. They're made out of good quality material. Uh, and in fact, they're decorated with tablet woven silk bands sewn along the seams, uh, similar to the kinds of silk uh, stripes you have on the side of your tux trousers. Uh, and these are uh, very finely made, probably in multiple colors of silk. Very fancy. Uh, he was wearing, he had a doublet or a short jacket with a fairly tightly fitting body, but loose sleeves that were open along the front seam so you'd be able to see his shirt. It's very fashionable. That fashion had just come in about two or three years earlier. So he's up to the minute there. What's interesting is we can reconstruct how big he was from the garment. It's well enough preserved. We can see he was about five foot 11 tall, which would have made him a giant. Being five foot 11 in Sweden in 1628 is like being six foot six in America today. Very tall guy. And so meet Balthazar, an exceptionally tall man can't tell you how old he is, of course. All of his possessions are of good quality. Uh, it, his, some of his stuff is very current fashion, his shoes and his jacket. His breeches, he, liked, he was liked older fashion. If you look at any society, if you look at what people are wearing to, uh, today, you're going to look at the past 30 years of fashion. 
because there are plenty of people who don't modernize their dress. They like, uh, you know, they like that leisure suit, you know, from the 70s. So they keep wearing it. Uh, he, but the fact that he had that much money and a full second set of clothing and shoes suggests he was a person of means. And the fact that he had a, a sword belt and thus a sword marks him as a gentleman. So even though without his, uh, with only his possessions, without any parts of Balthazar himself, we can say a lot about him. We can also say he's not any of our skeletons. He's another person entirely. Now, the next tri trick is to figure out who he might have been, what rank, what role he might have had on board the crew. That's the next phase of the research, and that's somewhat more complicated. And in closing, I'll just introduce you to our research team. I, I, I'm just the front man for this band. Um, all this research is being done by a lot of other people, uh, textile experts, shoe experts, um, historians, or I'm the archeologist, uh, photographers, uh, people who are really good with computer data analysis. And this is being funded by a number of uh, foundations. Our textile research alone uh, is funded by three different organizations uh, as a fairly major project. That's what we can say about somebody, even lo someone long gone, what we could say about you if we could find enough of your stuff, or if we could find you, uh, what we might be able to say about you 400 years hence. Thank you. <laughs>